Hey everybody, how you doing? Dylan here. Let's talk about web apps. Or let's talk about the web since before anyone called it web apps. Let's talk about websites. Let's talk about the different architectures and patterns that we have used to build stuff on the web going all the way back to the 1990s. Now when uh, I wrote my first web page in 1992, I'm basically an internet dinosaur. And back when the web first started, it was pretty simple what it could do. Browsers could send a request to a server and say, hey, get me that file. And web servers were basically file servers with a network connection. They didn't do anything. All they could do was you put files in a folder and when the browser says, hey, get me that, the server gave the file back and the browser would render it. And it would go, hello, welcome to our website in glorious Times New Roman. And then it would go, oh, hang on, this page has got an image on it. It's got a GIF. And so it would send a request going, hey, can you get me images welcome GIF? And the server would go, oh, yeah, I got that one here. And boom, we get animated GIFs. And uh, 90s web design had peaked at around this point. Now, this pattern, this is static HTML. We didn't call it that because uh, we didn't need to call it anything. It was just web pages. That, that's all we had. But static HTML... It's, uh, it was a great way in the 90s of delivering content, showing people stuff they wanted to read. In 2024, it's still a great way of delivering content. If you've got stuff that doesn't change very often, maybe your restaurant has a menu that changes once a month, you can upload a file once a month. You can stick it in GitHub pages. You can put it on an Amazon S3 bucket and make that bucket public. You can use a content delivery network. The thing about static HTML is it is incredibly cheap because you don't have to do any processing. All your server is doing is going, yeah, here's the file. And that is trivial. You can run a site that gets you know, thousands, millions of hits for a few dollars a month using static HTML hosting. You can run it for free on something like GitHub pages. It won't cost you anything at all. It's a great idea back in the 90s for certain kinds of problems. It's still a great idea today. Now, the next thing that happened, HTTP 1.1, uh, 1.0, then 1.1, came with the ability to fill out forms. Someone like, these static pages are all well and good, but what if, what if we want our users to contact us or send us a message or buy something? And so HTML forms were invented, and most of the time when you finished filling out a form, you'd hit submit, and that would send a request to, it sent a post request to some kind of script, like sendmail.pl was a famous Perl script that let you send emails from your web page. And when that request came in, sendmail would go, oh, hang on, all right, uh, let's wake up, let's read the form, let's generate, send the email, let's generate some HTML, and it would send that email back to the client, and the browser would go, hey, form sent, thank you, back to the home page. Now, this was the origin of server-side rendering. There's some code on the server which runs a program or runs a script, and one of the outputs of that is a chunk of HTML that then gets rendered by the browser. Server-side rendering has really stood the test of time, from CGI bin, bash scripts, through PHP, uh, classic ASP, Ruby on Rails, Node.js, WordPress, uh, ASP.NET Core, if you use an MVC, all of these technologies are based on server-side rendering. It worked brilliantly back in the, well, Maybe it didn't work quite so brilliantly with CGI, but it has really stood the test of time. It's a really powerful pattern. The only downside is every time anyone hits one of your pages, you need to run the code that generates the result, and that can get expensive. If you've got thousands of people, tens of thousands hitting your site, you're paying for all those cycles. You're paying for that computing power. Now, in the 90s, the future of web applications was going to be Java applets. No one was going to build apps in JavaScript. You were going to use Java, and you were going to build little applets so someone could get a page from your site, and you'd send back some HTML which included an applet tag or an object tag. And the browser, out of the box, would go, you can't show that. You need a plugin. So you'd install the plugin, and then, hey, then the plugin would go, right, I'm installed. Let me go to the server. I'm going to get this Java class file here, and boom, there you go. And suddenly you've got rich interactivity. You've got games. You've got you know interactive forms and applications. Now, this pattern, it wasn't just Java. Uh, Shockwave, Flash, Director, Real Player, QuickTime, all of them used the browser plugin ecosystem to do things that browsers couldn't do out of the box. Now, this kind of seemed like a great idea. It had some security headaches. Then in 2007, 
Apple launched the iPhone. And Apple went on record very early as saying, no, the iPhone is never going to run Java applets or Shockwave or Flash. It's never going to run any plugins. Please build web applications instead using JavaScript and HTML. We are not going to support plugins. And that basically signed the death warrant for the whole plugin paradigm, you know, it kind of hung on for a couple of years. But by 2015, if you had an app that needed Java applets, you had a big problem finding browsers that knew how to run it. Now, during the 90s, JavaScript was invented in 1995, and it was originally just a glue language for sticking Java applets together. The applets would do all the heavy lifting, and you could do some fairly rudimentary stuff with it, like someone could fill out your contact form, and then when they got down here and they clicked submit, you could run a little snippet that would go, hey, confirm, are you sure, and pop up dialogues. But it was really restricted. One you had to include everything in the page script. There was no way that client-side JavaScript could retrieve more data, couldn't make requests, couldn't talk to the rest of the world. And two, there was no way of sending anything back. Your client or your user is halfway through filling out a really complicated form with lots of JavaScript and everything on it. If they press refresh, it's all gone completely. Lost their work, they gotta start again. Now, I remember what I was doing the day that this changed because this would have been 2002 maybe, and Google launched a prototype, a proof of concept for a Google search that had autocomplete. Now, I remember looking at this and calling over my friend at the next desk and being like, hey, check this out, how did they do that? Because we were building web apps, we were building websites for clients and they asked for this and we kept telling them it's impossible, there's no way to do that. And Google had figured out a way to do it. And actually the origin of this, remarkably, it comes from Outlook Web Access. In about 2000, the team who were building Outlook Web Access, this is the web client for Microsoft Outlook, wanted a way of sending requests in the background. So they went to the people who built Internet Explorer and said, hey, can we, can we have a component that we can use to make like network requests without having to reload the page? And the Internet Explorer people said, yeah. And they plugged in a thing called XML HTTP request. Outlook Web Access used this for a couple of years, but no one really kind of noticed because there weren't that many people using Outlook Web Access. Um, support got added in uh, Netscape, a couple of other browsers so that they worked with Outlook. And then Google went, actually, we can use this to do cool stuff. Now, what's actually happening here is every time you press a key, your browser is sending a request and getting fresh suggestions. Every time you press a key, you've got this conversation backwards and forwards going on in the background. And this unlocked a whole new way of building web applications. Now, this was initially uh, the XML HTTP request wasn't terribly catchy. Around about 2005, someone said, hey, why don't we call it AJAX, Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, or Asynchronous JSON and XML HTTP request, because um, a lot of the time they were using the XML HTTP request, but the thing that's coming back from the server wasn't XML, it would be JSON, or something else, could be snippets of HTML. Um, this pattern worked brilliantly, unlocked all kinds of cool authoring paradigms. In about 2015, the browser vendors went, we could probably come up with a nicer way of doing this. And so they implemented an API called Fetch. Fetch is still around today. Fetch works brilliantly. You can do really cool stuff with it. But this ability to send background requests meant we could start building new kinds of web applications. Instead of your web app being a collection of pages that lived on a server, you could send a single page to the client with enough behavior baked into it that when the client went, hey, show me a blue guitars, you could send a request to your backend API, something like a REST API, and you go, hey, just get me the data for blue guitars. And it would send back some data and you'd swap out that part of the page and you go red guitars and you send a request, you'd get the data, you'd plug that in. You'd go, oh, what about black guitars? And send a request and that would come back and boom, there are the black guitars. Now, single page apps work brilliantly most of the time. It's a really, really powerful paradigm for rich client side interactivity. When they don't work so well, the dead giveaway here is that one bit of the page will start spinning because there's a, an element somewhere which is waiting for data to come back from the server and until it gets it, it can't draw anything. So if you're ever on a web page where you click a button and a little part of the page is replaced with a spinning icon, you're looking at a single page application. Now, single page apps proved incredibly popular. React, Angular, a lot of the JavaScript frameworks that came out in the last sort of 15 years uh, favored this pattern and they work brilliantly. The next 
paradigm shift that came about. All the technology we got so far, it all has the same problem. The browser has to start everything. It doesn't matter if the server has the most exciting piece of news in the world, it can't do anything with it until it gets a request. So the user has to click a button or click a link or some script on that client has to run and send a request to the server. And it turns out there's certain kinds of apps you can't really build like that. And so we invented WebSockets. And the idea with a WebSocket is the browser connects to the server and it just leaves the connection open. It's a new kind of connection, it's lightweight, it's long lived. And what this meant is we could build things like chat applications. You type hello there, that pops up a message here for me, sends a request to the server, hey, Dylan said hello there, but then that can send a notification. Now this is a big deal because for the first time we've got a way that the server can tell the browser, hey, something happened, look, boom, you got a message. And the person on the other end can go, oh, cool, a message, hello, how's it going? And that gets sent back, we use the same mechanism on the other side, and that pops up. Anything you've ever used that has real-time collaboration, a Google Docs, Google Sheets, Google Jamboard, if you use tools like Miro, all these things, web games, multiplayer gaming over the web, all of that, is probably based on WebSockets. Now, the last paradigm, the most recent one that's come about, up till now, everything here is running in JavaScript. If you want the browser to do anything, it has to be JavaScript. And there were a bunch of tools. Google Web Toolkit would let you write Java that would compile to JavaScript. Uh, CoffeeScript, TypeScript are languages that transpile down to JavaScript because that's the only thing that the browser can understand. Then uh, a few years ago, a bunch of folks got together and went, yeah, we're not sure that this whole having to compile everything to JavaScript is a good idea. Because um, when we run native applications directly on your laptop or your workstation, uh, you don't run them in JavaScript, you run them in native code. You have native executables. And they said, what if we built a, a native runtime that existed inside a web browser, web assembly? Now, the premise here is you can write your app in whatever you want. Go, Ruby, Rust, C Sharp, anything that compiles down to WebAssembly. And that will, you write your code, pick the tool you want, pick the language that works well for your problem or the language that your team enjoys using, write your application, compile it down to a WASM file, publish it on your web server. Then at this point, no JavaScript. We're using whatever language we want. We're not beholden to the language that the browser can understand. Then the client comes along. They say, hey, get me wasmtrist.html. It sends back. Now, there is still some JavaScript involved here because the only mechanism we've got right now for running WebAssembly is to use JavaScript to kind of bootstrap it. But you don't need very much of it. And what's that going to do? The browser is going to fetch that tetris.wasm file. It's going to execute it. And you've got rich native applications, high performance, rich interactivity running right there in the browser, kind of like Java applets were going to do in the 90s, only we've kind of learned a lot along the way. Now, the really interesting thing to me about this, uh, this sort of whole set of timelines here is the only one that's Genuinely dead is applets and plugins because that whole ecosystem just shut down, doesn't work anymore. But all of the rest, they still solve certain kinds of problems as well as they ever did. Static HTML, if you want to put a restaurant menu on the internet and change it once a month, static HTML was the best way of doing that in 1992. It's still the best way of doing that in 2024. If you want to render a product catalog and send back HTML, which works with search engines, works with screen readers, works with accessibility, server-side rendering is your friend. If you want to do minimal interactivity, you just got pages where you want some auto-complete or some auto-suggest, XML, HTTP, request, and uh, fetch, they work brilliantly for that. Single-page apps, yeah, they're awesome. They're everywhere, well understood, well documented, lots of people know how to build them. Web sockets, you get to a point where you're doing real-time notifications, that's fantastic. And if you get to the point where you want to build apps that you can deploy a native version and a web version, you've got a team who want to do stuff stuff in Rust or Go or C Sharp, or you need performance, you need really rich interactivity, then WebAssembly gives us a whole new box of tools to play with. So folks, I hope you found that useful. It's been a pleasure. I'll catch you for the next one. Take it easy.